The following audio is from the Paradox Church in Fort Worth, Texas. To support the mission of the Paradox Church, text your amount to 84321 or visit us online at theparadoxchurch.com slash give. Okay, good morning. Uh, My name is Jim, one of the pastors here. Good to have you. Glad you're here. Uh, I get to do uh, one of my favorite things uh, this morning. I, I get to uh, begin to preach through a book of the Bible. This is typically what we do is just grab a book of the Bible and walk through it uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And, and if you're new here, you're starting out great. This is the beginning uh, of our time in the book of Nehemiah. And I love Nehemiah. Uh, it's about the rebuilding of a city and the reforming of a people. The, the walls have been torn down. The people are in despair. Um, but it's not just any city or just any people, but it's the holy city. It's Jerusalem. Uh, and it's God's people, uh, the Israelites. Uh, they are representative of God and the promises of God. Uh, in the Old Testament, the, the Israelites, they were the midwives for this, this promised Messiah, this promised son that was coming to, to rebuild all cities and to restore all peoples. Uh, and, and so it, it, it's a big deal, right? It's a big deal, big, big city and an important uh, group of people that God is, is working in and through. Now, we learned this last year when we walked through the book of Revelation, that in the New Testament, we are uh, the, the new Jerusalem, that we are this new city, that we are God's people, the church. Uh, that in the same way they were representing God, we also represent God. We're the, we're the body of Christ in a particular place, that, that we represent who Jesus is and what Jesus is like, that we are to be a city on a hill, that the church is to be a city on a hill, a paradox city, in the midst of the, the city that we're in, this kind of alternate city that says, hey, if Jesus rules over you, this is what a people looks like. This is, this is how, they, how they handle money, and this is what they do with marriage, and this is how things work, and there's a, there's a flourishing to this city if those people were, were to be built up in Christ and, and to represent who he is to the people. And, and so if we're honest, um, some of our walls have been torn down. Uh, if we're honest, there's aspects of, of us that need reform, uh, that, that there's some things broken in our life and in our, in our families and, and in our church. There's some things that have, have been broken. We're gonna meet Nehemiah, he's this great leader, but we have even greater confidence because we have a greater leader, uh, his name's Jesus, by the way, um, who's a true and better Nehemiah. Who's, he's he's the, uh, the, the perfection of a, of a great leader who rebuilds a city. And so Jesus throughout the series is gonna invite us into his vision for your life. He's gonna invite us into what he's doing in you and in us as a people and as a church. And he's gonna show us how to do the work necessary to make much of his name in our lives, in our homes and in our church. And, and, and hopefully that, that flows out into our city. And so the great story of Nehemiah shows us how faithful God is to keep his promises, to do the work that he started in us. Maybe some of you just need to hear this. God is not done doing the work in you yet. No matter how old you are, doesn't matter how shattered the walls of your life are, it doesn't matter how God is not done rebuilding you. God's not done with you yet. We're gonna see that, we're gonna be encouraged in that uh, throughout the, the book of Nehemiah. What will our lives look like? What, what vision does he have for, for your life and for us as a church? And it really starts there. It starts with vision. It starts there. Do you have a vision for your life? Do you have a vision for your family? Do you have a vision for this church? Do you have a vision for the city? Uh, you get a vision for something when you're consumed with what is but what could be. Right? You see what is, and, and you see what it could be, and that consumes you. How do I go from here to there? Uh, I, 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 I recognize what this could look like, but it's not like that yet. It's not like that yet. And so a vision then is formed out of that kind of angst, even anger, like a righteous anger over what could be, what should be. What, what my marriage should look like, what my family should look like, what, what this church could be, what this city could be. And we have a vision. I've had a a handful of conversations recently with people, uh, usually men, in part because I I am one. Um, But, uh, and there seems to be like a pattern. Usually they're like 24, 25, 26 year old men uh, who have, uh, you know, they they graduated school and they just got their first job. Or it's like late 30s, early 40s men, okay? Uh, 
because now they have the family and the kids and they're kind of asking the same questions and the same question is, now what? Now what? Right, you know how like, kids have different developmental ages and stuff like that? Men do too, we have a lot of developing to do. We're still growing up. And so the same kind of language is, it, it keeps coming up in my conversations. It's kind of, now what? They've got some money but don't know what to do with it, now what? They've got a job but don't know what to do with it, now what? They've got the family, the wife, the kids, but don't know what to do with it. Maybe you're new to this church and like, what do I do with this thing? What am I supposed to do here? What, what is that? You know, they, you, you have a church, but you don't know what to do with it. The book of Nehemiah is for you. Uh, my prayer for us all week has been that, that Jesus would give you a fresh vision for your life uh, and for your family and for this church. Uh, that, that he'd give you a fresh, fresh vision and would stir you up to kingdom action, not activity, not busyness, we have plenty of things to do. We're plenty busy, but, but intentional, meaningful, actual kingdom action. It would, it would spur you on towards a particular vision that Jesus has for you. And it's going to feel, I'm just giving you a warning right now, it's going to, whatever Jesus has for you, as you engage with him this morning and, and over, the, over the weeks, it's going to feel too big for you. It's going to feel too big for you. Uh, if it's not big enough to scare you, it's not a kingdom vision, it's just an idea, you know? If, if you think you can do it and you feel ready, it's not a kingdom vision, it's just, a, it's just an idea. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about. If it doesn't move you to fasting and prayer, that's not, that's not a kingdom vision, that's just a thing you're going to do on your own power. That's not what I'm, I'm talking about at all. God has to grow us into our vision, right? God uses things too big for us to grow us up. So let me, let me, I'll give you just a quick illustration and it's mainly just to get this off my chest, okay? Um, so I, I recognize, I was, I've taken one of my girls to get shoes recently and I realized that over the past six months, I think I've bought like 47 pairs of shoes, okay? Because, you know, they need shoes for everything apparently. Uh, you have to have shoes for track and shoes for basketball and shoes for volleyball and shoes for soccer and shoes for school and shoes for, you know, uh, you know the second Tuesday of the month. You have to have like these different kind of, you know, moments of shoes. And so uh, I don't know if you realize, like, like shoes are expensive now. Uh, you know, apparently we care about other kids in other countries, and so we're not buying those kind of shoes anymore. So I don't, you know, which is good. That's a good thing. Um, but shoes are expensive. So, peop, you know, uh, young couples will say, you know, we don't have kids yet. We're trying to save up, you know, money. You don't need money for babies. You need no money for babies. Babies don't cost anything. They don't wear clothes. They don't eat food, okay? <laughs> When, they're ten, when they turn eight, that's when you need money, okay? When they turn eight. So we go buy these shoes. And here's what I, so here's what I realized, and this is becoming way too long of a story for the point I'm trying to make. I started buying them shoes like a size, size and a half too big, right? Because it's like, you're going to have to wear these for a while, they cost $1,700, okay? So I'm gonna need you to wear these a little bit. You know, it's like, what about hand-me-downs? There's no hand-me-downs with kids' shoes. Do you see kids' shoes two weeks after you buy them? They're torn up, mud all over. I mean, there's, these, these shoes aren't going to make it that long to hand to their sister. And so it's like we're going to buy, you know, a, a, a size and a half too big. Well, it's uncomfortable, Daddy. Stuff some Kleenex in there. Don't worry about it. Just figure it out. <laughs> Luck you have shoes, you know. Uh, and so I just buy them like, the, you know, so that so we, get, we get two biggest shoes so that they can grow into them. Okay, here's my point. Not a great point, but here's the point. God gives you a vision too big for you so that you will grow into it. It will feel uncomfortable at first, but the point is that you're going to grow into uh, these shoes <laughs> that, that, the Lord, that the Lord gives you, okay? And so the book of Nehemiah, it's meant to stir in you this fresh vision to show you what God is doing in your life, and it's going to feel too big. Now, Nehemiah, he faces this, this huge, great problem. In verse one, we meet him, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakala. He, he is... Um, he is not a, a theologian, he is not a, a pastor, he's not a paid ministry professional. In fact, he, he's, he's a government worker. He, he says in verse 11, I was cupbearer to the king. That doesn't sound like much, but it, it's actually a pretty high position in the, in the Persian government. He's in Susa, which is where the, the, the king of Persia would winter. And, and so that's where he is, but he's, he's, not a, he's not a religious man. He's not a religious, uh, you know, he doesn't have a religious vocation. He's just a dude working a job. And much of Nehemiah is actually his personal journal. 
And so we get insight into his heart and his mind uh, at the challenges that are before them. And, and it is a great challenge. He says in the second part of verse one, uh, that it happened in the month, month of Chislev, that's November or December, in the 20th year, I was in Susa the citadel, that Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. I asked them concerning the Jews uh, who had escaped and who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. Shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates destroyed by fire. Here's the context. 150 years before Nehemiah, the Babylonians had uh, taken God's people into exile, uh, deported them, and they, they, they you know, and, and so then you have, you know, Daniel and some of that. We're going to cover that this fall, actually. Um, but then 50 years after that, the Persians overcame the Babylonians and allowed for the Jews to go back home. But most didn't. So just the remnant goes back to the holy city of Jerusalem. And about 13 years before Nehemiah, they had rebuilt the temple. Okay, so that's, that's the context. And so Nehemiah, his brother shows up in town and he asks him about what, what, man, what's going on with the city, what's going on with the, the remnant that went back. And you can kind of picture his brother's face, just kind of downcast and defeated and just saying, the walls are still down and we're in great trouble and great shame. In, a, in an ancient city, you needed walls. If you didn't have walls, you, couldn't, you weren't protected. If you didn't have walls, you couldn't build or cultivate any other kind of culture. You couldn't have a flourishing uh, worship community there. You couldn't have uh, industry or growing economics without walls because you'd just be constantly defending yourself from the opposition and from the enemies. And presumably, they've, they've tried, right? They've attempted to build the city back up, but for some reason, they failed. They haven't been able to build up the wall. They built up the temple, but they haven't figured out how to build up the, the wall. They're in great trouble and shame. They, they've received countless opposition and mocking from neighboring nations and tribes who do not want God's name to be worshiped again in Jerusalem. We, we know this because Nehemiah is gonna face the same thing, all kinds of like literal just mocking and joking and slander over the people of God and then other sorts of Opposition, And they're just this small remnant trying to defend themselves, being laughed at by the people around them, and they don't have the money or people to do what they, what they need to do. This may sound not very spiritual, but people and money does a lot. Right? You need people and money, and good leaders figure out how to go get the people and the money to get the job done. And so God has this vision to see Jerusalem rebuilt and the city flourishing, and he, he told them through the prophets he was going to do it, but in Nehemiah's day, nothing, not much had happened so far, the, the temple was rebuilt 13 years before, but efforts of reform had failed. What's interesting is we are 13 years old as a church. We're 13 years old. Uh, we, we planted a temple, so to speak, where the presence of God would be known, where God's people could flourish and grow up. And, and last year, we built some literal walls, but we still have work to do. There's still a city to rebuild. We still have work to do. There's still a city that we've been placed in. And if we're honest, before we even do that or consider much of that, our own walls are still torn down. There's aspects of our own life that are broken. There's parts of us that need reform as well. And so let me ask you, where in your life are the walls still torn down? Where around you do you see people, maybe even in your own family or close to you, that are they're downcast and defeated in despair? And maybe, maybe like the walls were, I mean, the walls have been torn down for over a hundred years. Over a hundred years. Maybe, maybe your walls have been down for a long time as well. Maybe you've even tried to build them up and for whatever reason, you couldn't. Where in your life are, are the walls of your life torn down and you're open to attack? You don't feel safe in this kind of aspect of your life or your family? And here's, here's where this is hard because sometimes, like not every problem is your problem. Not every wall is your wall to build back up. One of the challenges that's, uh, that you're going to face over the next few weeks, or really all into the summer as we finish up Nehemiah, is to discern what is a good idea and what is God's idea. You know, which battle are you supposed to fight? Where are you supposed to put your energy and efforts? Which part of the wall are you supposed to go into? Especially when you think about maybe this church or this city, because if, if some walls are down in your life, you gotta start there, 
right? We start in our own life. We start in our own family. Way, way too many men have a vision for their finances, but not for their family. I mean, way too many men have this vision for, you know, a new ministry, but they don't have a vision for their marriage or for their kids, right? So we start in our own home, but then we have to discern what is God calling us to, right? What is he calling us to? What is being asked of you? Not somebody else, not somebody you're trying to be, but you. Who needs something that only you can give? Nobody else can provide it. You can. God's called you there. What challenges are yours and yours alone to handle? They're your responsibility. What is needed from you right now? Maybe not what's needed of you in 10 years, but now God's given you a vision now for something. There's a part of the wall first that you have to rebuild. What is that? Thomas Merton, he said this, I love this. He says, it seems to me that I have greater peace and I am close to God when I am not trying to be anything special, but simply orientating my life fully and completely towards what seems to be required of a man like me at a time like this. Right now, what is God calling you to? How does Nehemiah respond? Verse four, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned. How, I, when I read this, this was my first thought. How long has it been since I wept and mourned for days? I wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah responds to this news. By the way, it's not new news. Nehemiah was not, you know, first made aware of his by, by his brother that the walls have been torn down. Uh, this, was, this was history. This is ancient history for God's people in the Old Testament. They knew that the walls had been torn down, but there was something about his brother's face, and there was something about hearing it again, for, like, you know, for the first time. Nehemiah is broken. He's broken. He hears this news that the walls are torn down, and it breaks him. It breaks him. When's the last time you were broken and desperate? When's the last time you fasted and prayed? Nehemiah, he weeps over Jerusalem and he fasts and, and prays. What's interesting is Jesus wept over Jerusalem too. In, uh, on Palm Sunday, when he's you know, riding in on the, on the donkey, it, he, he, he weeps over the city. He's outside of the city and he weeps over her because they had rejected him as king. In Luke 19, he says, he says, would that you have known the things that make for peace. You've rejected my salvation. You've rejected the promises of God. And he weeps, he's broken. He's broken over the brokenness of Jerusalem. What makes you weep? What makes you weep? Nehemiah, again, this is something that had been going on for over 100 years, but Nehemiah is confronted with it again and it breaks him. Sometimes fresh vision happens when an old wound is broken open. All right, it, there's been, like, you attempted to, bring, to get healing. You attempted to see restoration in a, in a place, but it scabbed over and there's scar tissue and, and you're not healthy, you're not, you're not flourishing, you're not totally whole, but you know, you haven't picked at it in a while and, and fresh vision, it sometimes takes old wounds being opened up. What old news should break you? What has been broken for a while now and we need to see it with new eyes and have a vision for what it could be instead of settling for what is? Still, we struggle with the same sin that's been besetting us for years. Still, we have the same character issues or dynamic in our family, and we hate it, but we don't seem to do much to bring about any, any sort of change. Still, we have bitterness and unforgiveness from that old relationship, and it's enslaving us. Still, we hear the same complaints from our spouse about a part of our marriage, and, and we've yet to uh, you know, revisit what it looks like build that part of our marriage back up. Still, we drive through the city and see the same brokenness. Still, we walk on the same campus and see the same darkness. We keep hearing the same kinds of stories still. And at some point, does it break you? Does it break you? I, I keep having the same conversations with men and it's been breaking me. I keep finding myself in conversations with families of Down syndrome children and the struggle to find schools in Fort Worth and it's frustrating me. I keep... I keep seeing the, the surface level, lukewarm Christianity of Fort Worth and it angers me. What do you mourn over? What do you, how do you respond to those kind of things when you see them? What do you weep over? Right? 
That's my big question, I think, for this morning, is just how are you going to respond when you see the walls torn down? Every one of us in our life and in the, you know, the life around us, we see the walls down. We're not blind. We see the areas where life is broken, something's broken, the city's broken, the people around me are broken, my family's broken. We see it. So the big question is not do you see it, but what do you do with it? How do you respond in that moment? Nehemiah weeps. Jesus weeps. What will you do? Will you have passion or dispassion? When you see it, will you be active or passive? Will you pray and mourn or will you just continue to complain and criticize? Will you take responsibility or will you blame shift? Will you have zeal or will you have apathy? How you respond is everything. We all see the walls torn down. What are you gonna do? Are you able to enter in emotionally to that thing? <laughs> oh, man. There's this thing that I've been, I've been studying for a, 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 little, a little while now. The, the ancient church fathers, they had this word for the kind of spiritual uh, depression and spiritual laziness that we can find ourselves in sometimes. They called it ascidian. And it's a Greek word that, that takes the, the Greek word for care, sidia, and puts that prefix ah in front of it. So like, like ah, theist, an atheist is without, you know, belief in a God. A sidia is, is where you, you care less. You don't care. A sidia sees the walls that have been torn down, but does, isn't, does, you don't mourn over, you don't weep over. It doesn't do anything in you. Nothing happens in your gut when you see the brokenness of your own life or the life of the people around you. Kathleen Norris, she describes it this way, when life becomes too challenging and engagement with others too demanding, Asidia offers a kind of spiritual morphine. You know the pain is there, yet you can't rouse yourself to care. Adam Grant, the organizational psychologist, he defines it as a sense of stagnation and emptiness, a muddled, joyless, aimless drift. Man, we're like, you have this spiritual melancholy and you see things, but you don't care, right? There's an aimlessness, there's a, 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 an apatheticness, there's an, uh, it, 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 you're atrophied in your spiritual muscles. A city, it, always, it doesn't always, by the way, translate to laziness either. It doesn't mean you're necessarily lazy. You could be very, very busy just with the wrong things. Right, so you have this busyness. It's where you're like, you're going after the thing that's easy or the thing that you can connect to, but you're not addressing the real problem in your life. The, the walls are torn down over here and you're like painting the other walls over here. It's like, why are you painting that? You just, this, they're, they're gonna come in over here. No matter if this looks good, if that's torn down. What's interesting is that I feel like, so um, last year, uh, I feel like at the end of last year, I was battling this kind of spirit of apathy. I was tired. You, you know, we, last year, many of you are new, so you don't even know some of this, but beginning of last year, we just had a really, we were, we were still at the Ridgely Theater. We just had a powerful couple of months. And we're just the spirit, like, just was kind to, to pour out uh, on us and on our people. And it was just beautiful. And then I, and then I, and then I finished this three-year project that we're in right now, and and, 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 and then I got hit by a car and, and then we, we baptized our babies and I preached through the book of Revelation and, and wrote two books last year and, and it just kind of came to the end of the year. I was just kind of done, like I was done. I just felt drained, I felt drained. And here, here's the problem with the city. Uh, you, can, you can stay busy with the stuff that's easy. You just don't connect with the stuff that's hard. So I could preach really good sermon. I'm, I've done this for a long time. Okay, I'm good at this. I can preach really good sermons um, and not be super connected to the brokenness of my own life or the people that I'm meant to minister and you would never know. You would never know. You'd be like, oh, good. you did. You said good pastor, good, good, good preacher, pastor. Good sermon, pastor. <laughs> yeah. Now you can't preach great sermons. You can't do great work, you, 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 kingdom impact takes a great God and a great spirit and the anointing of that spirit on a man or a woman that's connected to God and what he is doing. It wasn't great, but it's good, pretty good. 
So we wrestle through this, right? We, we find ourselves in these kind of bouts of Assidia and it's this, this deep spiritual melancholy where we don't have any sort of zeal or care. Now, short bouts of Assidia aren't necessarily bad. I think they can actually be helpful. It's God setting you up for some holy discontent so he can rile you up to something new. But if it goes on too long, all of a sudden there's this spiritual atrophy that begins to take place in your spiritual heart and it can get very dangerous. I get really nervous when my life uh, lacks vision. Uh, I, I thrive, I, I need that, I'm fueled on that. But what I found is that I, I can still have vision for the easy things, it's the hard things that really matter that I can't in those moments. Like if I gave you $100 million and it said, hey, give me a vision for what you're gonna do with this money, that'd be easy. It's $100 million. Right, you, could, you could lay down you know, 10 things, 10, man, here, here's my vision for that 100 million you gave me, thank you. But how do you have a vision for your family when there's chaos in the home, not just when it's flourishing? How do you have a vision for your ministry when it's still small and it's taking a while to get off the ground? How do you have a vision for your life when you can barely keep your head above water, not when you're killing it? How do you have a vision for a business that honors God when you have no money yet? When it's hard, how do you have that? And that, when it's harder, sometimes the city creeps up and all of a sudden you get to that point where the walls are still torn down and, and you don't really care. You don't really care. Paul, he told leaders in Romans 12, 8 to lead with zeal. Lead with zeal. Don't just lead by your, you know, your, your habit and ability. Lead through zeal. Later, he says, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. So then what do we do? What do we do when the spirit of apathy overtakes us? Well, this is where we need the church. I love the church. I need the church. You need the church. This is when you need the church. The church can rouse us up, encourage us. The church can, can get us out of that kind of spirit of apathy. We need encouragement. One of the purposes of biblical community, Hebrews 10, is to stir one another up to love and good deeds. Right, what if this morning, literally this morning, you asked God who you should stir up to encourage them in this place? Right, literally here, like you didn't see this as this kind of religious performance that you just consumed from, but you saw this as a part of your ministry that before and after the service, during the service, do, do, it, do it now. God, who can I encourage today? Who can I encourage today? We, um, we underestimate the power of encouragement. On Easter Sunday last week, this older gentleman came up to me uh, before one of, the, one of the four services we were doing. I met him a few times. Uh, and he came up to me with this, like, fierce eyes. Like, he just, it was a very serious spiritual moment. He said, man, I see the anointing of God on you. God is moving in this place. He's doing something here. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a grown man. Before a word came out of his mouth, his eyes made me cry. And I'm a grown man, and on Sundays, I kind of have like game face on. If you ever run into me on Sundays, like I'm, I'm not all there. I'm like, I'm very, and it's Easter Sunday, so I'm like super game face. I didn't think I needed anything. And his words gave me a shot in the arm. I mean, just one word, man. I mean, think about, think about like that one word can carry you for a week. We know that because that one word can crush you for a week. We're fragile, man. Fragile. We are fragile people. We are not that strong. But we can build each other up and be really strong with the words of encouragement from our brothers and sisters. Right, so we encourage one another. We encourage one another in those moments. Or um, actually, listen to this, Larry Crabb. This is great. A vision we give to others of who and what they could become has power when it echoes what the Spirit has already spoken into their souls. There's so much power in that. I and mean, you have no idea what your brother or sister is going through all the time. Like, you just don't know. You don't know. And you don't know what the Spirit has been speaking. If you speak something into them and it connects with what the Holy Spirit has been trying to tell them, that's a powerful moment. The second thing we can do is honor one another. One of our cultural values at, 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 as the church or at, at this church is that we honor one another. Um, in particular for, for men, we have this kind of tendency to show affection by making fun of each other. 
Right? It's kind of the opposite. It's like this locker room thing that we just never grew out of. But what if, what if your brother didn't need another joke? What if he needed to feel honored by you? Like in a world of shame, in a world of mocking, in a world of just that kind of inner critic, in a world of what if we were to honor one another? Like I was thinking about this. If we saw that as like our responsibility to bear, if you, if you, if you heard that cultural value, not as something that Jim and the staff is, is meant to carry, but me as a Christian, as a member of this church, as a part of this people, I'm going to cultivate this culture of honor. And I'm gonna do it right here in this place. I'm gonna look at Sundays as a place where I can walk up to a brother or sister and just say, I've seen God's work in you. Here's what he's doing, I see it, keep going. Keep going. Man, that'll just do, that'll just do something. That'll do something. Uh, you have no idea what, what life-changing words those could be. All right, just fuel to get somebody going. Fuel to get somebody out of their apathy. Fuel to, to make them pursue the vision that God has for them. We don't know what they're walking through. But can you imagine if that was the culture of Sundays here? It wasn't so much the, the surface level chatter, which, I mean, I get it. I mean, that's good. We, we need to connect. We need to talk. We need to say hi. We need to meet each other and all, all of that. But if, the, if this place was a culture of honor and we used these kind of words to each other, the defeated and dejected of the city would flock to this place. Those that are in despair, it, like, like fresh water to a part soul, they would flock here. Man, when we say this is like one of our cultural values, it means this is what we want to be known for. In the city, we want to be known for this people that honors one another. Yeah, that'll get us out of our apathy. Third, we encourage one another, we honor one another. Third, we encourage one another towards the, the, the zealous God that we serve. Did you know that? Did you know that God is not dispassionate? God doesn't play it cool. God is very passionate. After Jesus tore into the temple and, you know, overturned all the, all, all the tables, his disciples, they remembered something from the Old Testament. They remembered this Old Testament uh, psalm. Do you, do you remember, remember what they said? Zeal for his house consumes him. Zealous, he's zealous. Jesus is zealous. God, in, in the Old Testament, in, in Isaiah, he's grieving the Assyria present in his people and that, that nobody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so he says in, in, in Isaiah 59, he says, justice is turned back. Righteousness stands far away. How about this line? For truth has stumbled in the public squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man. There's no one. He wondered that there was no one to intercede. So what does he do? He takes care of himself. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal. God is passionate. We worship a, a God of vision and passion and zeal. He's not apathetic towards you. He's not lazy towards you. He's not bored with you. You've not annoyed him. He doesn't keep himself at a distance. No, he keeps coming after you and pursuing you. Why do you think you're here? It's the God of the universe coming after you with passion and zeal, wanting to speak a fresh vision into your life. And so our God does not leave us alone. How do we get out of apathy? Our God pursues us in our apathy with great zeal. And so Nehemiah, he responds by mourning. And then look what he does. He, he prays, verse five. Then he prays. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Is God great and awesome? The great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. God is a promise-keeping God. Nehemiah, he says, you are great and awesome and you always keep your promises. He starts with who God is, not the situation and how bad it is, not his own, you know, uh, heart or response or, or anything. He starts with God. You are great and awesome and you will keep your promises. Verse six, 
Let your ear be attentive and your ears open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night, the people of Israel, your servants. Listen to this. Confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. So check this. He's going to confess his sins. He's going to clean his house first. He recognizes that there's walls broken down in his own life and his family's life first before he asks God to help him build up the walls of the city. But notice he also confesses the sins of the people of Israel. <laughs> he takes responsibility not just for his own sins, but the sins of his community. That's what a good leader does, by the way. A good leader is going to take responsibility even if it wasn't his fault. And so he confesses also the sins of the people. Well, he recognizes that he's taken part in that. He recognizes that he's been a beneficiary maybe of their rebellion of God or their sins against other people. And so he, he's, he's confessing corporately, not just personally. He's owning the brokenness of the city. Like we think about, we think about the city and, and some of its ways and we, we look at it and we're like, man, maybe I could be, maybe I could help out there. Maybe I could do something about that. But you're no savior. You're part of the problem. We look at the American church, right? Where we look at the, the church in the South. We look at the church in Fort Worth and we just, we feel broken over it. I feel angry about it sometimes. But I'm gonna own some of that. I'm gonna confess the sins of the church in Fort Worth, not just my own. I'm gonna own some of that. I wanna take responsibility for some of that. And then the language, the language of, of, of here, of, of he's confessing his sins, it's like he's not just, he's not making light of them. He's literally slamming them down before the feet of God. That's the language. Like spiking his sins before, the, before, the, before God. Because here, here's what happens. Our sin it, in, the, in, 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 in seasons of Assyria, our sin doesn't seem all that severe. Because we're apathetic towards the things of God and the people around us, we don't recognize how severe our sin is. We, we don't see that our anger is deep and it affects the people around us. We don't see that, that the, the, you know, whatever it might be is severe. And so we start playing with it. By the way, the enemy wants that. The enemy wants you numb. He wants you to not notice. He wants you to not care. He wants you to be careless about the little pet sins in your life so they begin to grow all the more and all of a sudden another wall gets torn down in your life. So now you can't build up this one because now you got more walls. The enemy is seeking to destroy you. He doesn't want you to think your sin is all that bad. Nehemiah says, no, no, I'm gonna confess my sin. I'm gonna confess the sin of my people and I'm gonna slam that before the Lord. I'm gonna confess that before the, this is a big deal. I lay this before the, this great and merciful God. So he confesses his sins first. He says, we have acted very corruptly against you. Verse seven, we've not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. That's what had happened. They were exiled in Babylon because they had disobeyed God. Verse nine, but if you return to me, if you repent, and keep my commandments and do them. Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell. His name, God's name was to dwell in Jerusalem. God's name has been written on your heart. God, he's appealing to God's glory here. He's saying, you're not gonna let Jerusalem stay broken, are you? That's where your name is. That's where you're famous. That's where your glory shines from. He's not going to leave you alone either. He has put his name on you. For his name's sake, he's not done with you. Yeah. For his name's sake, he's not gonna make a mistake with you. For his name's sake, he comes after you and continues to rebuild the brokenness of your life. He says, I'm gonna gather them, bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Verse 10, they are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. We're gonna see next week, Nehemiah figures it out. Figures out, how do I get the people? How do I get the money? And he's gonna use, he's gonna leverage his position for the kingdom of God. His position is not for his own kingdom, but for the kingdom of God. His position is meant for the good of others, not just for his good. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with this. 
You are not being asked to be Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah is not given to us so that we can look at Nehemiah and just say, I need to do that too. That's not the point of Nehemiah. Um, Jesus is Nehemiah. Jesus is the Nehemiah, the great leader of your life. Jesus is the one that's building the walls back up in your life. It's Jesus who never gets apathetic. It's Jesus who never gets, he's never indifferent towards you. It's Jesus who mourns over the brokenness of your home, of your marriage, of your life, of your church, of your city. It's Jesus who, in his zeal, begins to, he has a vision, he begins to build up the walls of your life. Here, here's, here's some really good news. Maybe you didn't know this. Um, Romans 8.29 is God's vision for your life. Romans 8.29. It says, you were predestined to be conformed into the image of the Son. That before things existed, before a brick was laid, before the sun shone, before uh, flowers bloomed, before the mountains quaked, before anything happened, you were predestined to be conformed into the image of Jesus. You will look like Jesus. Amen. He will not stop until you are made whole. So this vision that Jesus has for you, he's doing that work. Here's, here's our work. He just invites us in. Jesus is inviting you in to the work that he's doing in you. And he's inviting you in to the work that he's doing in, his, in your church. He's inviting you in to the work that he's doing in your city. Right, he's got all the stuff. He's got the bricks. He's got the mortar. He's got water. You need water, I think, for that mortar. And, I don't know, you know. He's got all the stuff. He's got all the supplies. He's got all the tools. And he's working it. Right, he's working it. Like, he's, he, paid, he, paid, he paid all the money for it. He, he, he took care of the cost. It's already been purchased. And so now he's building you back up brick by brick. And he just invites you to take, hey, come here. Let me show you what I'm doing. I want you to see this. I want you to see this work that I'm doing. And so here, here's what I want you to do. In fact, let's just get before the Lord. Don't look at me. Look at, let's get before the Lord. Because here, here's, our, here's our first step. Here's Nehemiah chapter one for us. Jesus has a vision for you. Will you, meet, will you meet him in that? He's wanting to show you the, the walls that are still broken in your life. Maybe old wounds that need to be broken open. Will you meet him in that? It's this invitation. And so for some of you, it's revisiting the walls in your life that have been torn down for a long time. put some construction fencing up over there at some point and kind of just hope and pray that nothing terrible happens. And Jesus is saying, hey, let's, let's restore this. Let's rebuild this. Let's fortify this part of your heart. You don't have to be afraid of the great and awesome God. And I keep my promises. Some of you just need to confess your, your spirit of apathy. You just need to tell God, like, I, I just got nothing. I got nothing. I don't think I have it in me 
to try this again. I, I'm busy over here doing some things that I really like and some good things in my life that are happening. I don't have the emotional or spiritual energy to go, out, to go build this thing up over here. Just confess that. And maybe some of you, you're already there. You're already at that place. You're, you're right there with Nehemiah. Just, you're just mourning and weeping. Mourn and weep. And just cry out to God. So Jesus, we just pray these things. We ask that you give us a fresh vision in this church. Those places of sin in our life that just are continued after us, would you, would you give us a hope and a vision for what it could be? For our relationships and friendships, our marriage, our parenting. We have a fresh vision of what it could be. What does obedience look like today? What are you calling us to today? Would you speak to us today? Call us to great work in the city. Call us to great work in the church. Let us not settle for living an individual Christian life. Let us see the dejection and despair in the eyes of those that are around us and then let it move us to act. Light a fire in your people. And so give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart, an emotional and spiritual heart that can connect the walls that are torn down around us. Pray this in your name and for your namesake. Amen.